I'll tell you a, a little story. So this is uh, the seventh meeting talking about linking uh, agriculture and nutrition. I got, a, I got a grant in 1993 from USAID to see what our system that I work for, the CGIR research centers, could do to help fight micronutrient malnutrition. And I went around, I, I visited nine centers in 1993 to talk to the plant scientists about the possibility of breeding more minerals and vitamins in plants. And I, I think the overwhelming response of the scientists was, why are you talking to me about human nutrition? I'm a, I'm a plant scientist. I'm here to increase yields. I'm here to, uh, you know, have pest resistance, disease resistance. We're here to reduce poverty. And you're coming, you're coming to me to talk to me about human nutrition. It doesn't make sense. Um, by the same token, when I would talk to the nutrition community, to nutrition donors, about uh, you know funding this idea and they said you want us to give money to agriculture research institutes and I said yes and they, we don't do that um, so it, the world has changed the world has changed a lot since uh, since the 1990s and so it's it's great to have this you know this huge group here talking about linking agriculture and nutrition and I, and I you know I think it's I think it's so important so I'm, uh, I'm an economist by training, and I'm going to give you a, a heavy dose of, uh, of a, an economist's perspective on agricultural strategies for improving nutrition. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by, by showing you my, my slide on the Green Revolution. So that red dashed line across the middle is a 100% increase between 19 what is it, 1965 and 1999, and you see the blue bar is population. Population doubled during that period. And policymakers knew that population increase was coming and they were worried there'd be widespread famine because there wouldn't be enough cereals, there wouldn't be enough uh, calories uh, to feed all those people. So we, had the, we created the CGIR system, we had the Green Revolution, we developed high yielding varieties of rice and wheat and maize. And the great success are represented by the orange bars, which more than doubled during that period. So we avoided widespread famine. But I want to draw your attention to the green bars, and that's what happened to pulse production. And I only put pulses there to keep it simple. I could, if I put vegetables, if I put fruits, if I put animal and fish products, the bars would be about the same height. So you had a 25% increase, but you didn't have the same productivity increases that you had for the cereals. So the supply of the, of the non-staple foods, those that are rich in minerals and vitamins, lagged behind population growth, lagged behind demand. So what happened to food prices? And I'm gonna talk over and over again about food prices and emphasize food prices. So I like to divide the diet into the food staples, the brown, the non-staple plant foods, the green and the red are, are the animal and the fish products. So if you look at what happened to prices in Bangladesh until the, from the beginning of the Green Revolution to the end of the 1990s, rice prices fell by 40%, which is great because Bangladeshis spend a high percentage of their income on rice. But the prices of the vegetables and the fruits and, and everything else, the non-staple foods, doubled during that period. So if you wanted to purchase better dietary quality, it became harder and harder for the poor if their incomes hadn't gone up. And this is fundamentally why, in my opinion, why I think we see so much widespread mineral and vitamin deficiencies in developing countries. I showed these data for Bangladesh for many years. We put together some data now for India. Same pattern, you see here the rice prices fell by 40%, stayed low for decades, have started coming back up again a little bit. But the kicker is here, the kicker is that you see that the, the prices of the vegetables and the fruits and the animal products and the pulses, everything has just gone up and up and up over 40 or 50 year period. And policymakers pay attention if the rice prices double and triple, but they don't pay attention when the prices of the non-staple foods go up. But we have all this micronutrient deficiency because of this. 
When I talk about agricultural strategies, I like to start with demand. The solutions are on the supply side, but you have to understand demand to understand what to do on the supply side. So this is, these, are, these are typical dietary patterns. This, the, the graph on the left is rural Bangladesh. The graph on the right is for the Philippines as a whole nation. So look at the brown row. Those are the food staples. These are the energy intakes, calorie intakes. And the different columns are from low income to higher income. So the thing to notice about food staples is that first of all, of course, a lot of your calories come from food staples. But what I wanna, what I wanna point out is that it doesn't change with income. Low income and high income people eat the same amount of food staples. So what do people do? The first thing they do is they buy enough food staples to keep from going hungry. Then they have some income left over. Some people have more than others income left over. So the next thing they do is they buy the non-staple plant foods to get some variety in their diets. And then as income goes up, they increase, they're able to increase, their budget constraint is released. And then what they really want though are the animal and the fish products, but they're the most expensive parts of the diet. In Bangladesh, this particular survey, they're 20, 20 times as expensive as a source of calories. And you can see there's a doubling. In Bangladesh, there's a doubling from low income to high income. In the Philippines, there's a tripling from low income to high income. But the amounts are low because they're expensive. So none of these diets, even in the higher income groups, support adequate dietary quality. So this is, you know, this is the pattern. Um, this is demand, and this is what's happening with demand. So we have to understand demand. So this shows for that rural Bangladesh population, this shows where the calories are coming from. Only that little sliver, 3% of the calories are coming from the animal and the fish products. But the Bangladeshis are spending 25% of their food budget on animal and fish products. That's how much they like them. And that's 20% of their income because they're spending 70% of their income on food. Okay, so diet, people want dietary quality. People demand dietary quality. But they're severely constrained by, the high, by their low incomes and the rising prices of the non-staple foods. So I wanna, I'll go through a little exercise now and say what happens when prices go up, all food prices go up by 50%. How do people react to that? How, does, how is demand affected? So this graph shows that, a, that those data for rural Bangladesh, about a third of their income goes for food staples, about a third of their income goes for the non-staple foods, and about a third of their income goes for non, uh, the non-foods, you know, the education, housing, clothing, et cetera. So now let's, let's, do a, let's do an exercise, a simulation exercise, and say what happens if all food prices go up by 50% and your income doesn't change? What happens to this expenditure pattern? How do people react? So the most fundamental thing is that people don't want to be hungry, so they continue buying, in this case, rice, the same amount of rice. So when the price of rice goes up by 50%, they have to spend a lot more for rice. And then less money's left over for the non-staple foods and even for non-foods. So the women on the left are iron deficient and the women on the right have a 30% lower iron intake, okay? If you can lower food prices, you can go from the graph on the right to the graph on the left and a lot of virtuous things happen. But that's not, that, that's not the pattern of what's been happening in agriculture. Really the non-staple foods have been going up. Now that's a bit of a theoretical exercise, but I wanna, I wanna show you a graph of a study from Indonesia. This is Patrick Webb was one of the authors. They had a financial crisis in Indonesia and there was a, there was a massive increase in food prices and, and they recorded, they had data to record the, the blood hemoglobin of the children in Indonesia. And you can see when the food prices went up, the blood hemoglobin went down. And then they solved, they solved the financial crisis and the food prices went back down to normal. And you can see the blood hemoglobin started, started rising again. So I, this is one of the best studies that I've, that I've seen that demonstrates the effect of food prices on nutritional status.
So we're good. now we're going to start to move to the supply side. That's the demand side. So we, we have a situation, this very simple diagram. If that whole reg area of the rectangle on the left are all the mineral and vitamin requirements of the population, the agricultural sector, the green, is not providing what's needed, so the nutrition community has come in with commercial fortification, with supplementation. There's some unreached populations. And now what we're all here today and we've been working on for years is to increase that green area because it's more sustainable, it's, less, uh, it's more, much more cost effective. I consider supplementation and fortification to be you know, very great, very necessary, but short-term measures that fill in the gaps until we can get the agricultural sector to provide the nutrients that they need. I think it's a, it's a very false dichotomy to say, for example, do we need either fortification or biofortification? No, biofortification is a way that we increase that green area over a long period of time. And in the meantime, we also have to implement fortification to fill in the gaps that, that presently exist and will exist you know, for decades to come, really. So let me, let me talk about how I approach. Okay, supply side. Now, how do we approach agricultural strategies for improving nutrition? And I like to take it, I like to take it a food group at a time. Um, there, there's no, you know, we work, you know, we should work on this food group or we should work on that food group. No, we, we need to work on all food groups simultaneously. But everybody finds their niche and finds what they want to do. So my niche has been the food staple group and the biofortification strategy. So to kind of introduce that, what's been happening to yields globally over time, well, yields have been going up quite dramatically, but the concentration of the protein and the iron and the zinc in the grains has gone down over time. We've bred for more starch, but we haven't paid attention to the protein, the iron, and the zinc. There's a high correlation between the protein in the grain and the iron and the zinc in the grain. So over time, that concentration has gone down. Well, so what? Big deal. You, you get your minerals and vitamins right from, from your non-staple foods. Well, that, that isn't the case for zinc in Bangladesh. This shows dietary pattern for Bangladesh, only I'm showing zinc intakes instead of calorie intakes. And you can see that zinc intakes from food staples are about six milligrams a day and provide about 60% of the zinc. And that's at a concentration, if you see that row down there present, 15 milligrams per kilogram multiplied by 400 grams gives you the six milligrams of zinc. Well, I'm pretty sure the concentration of the traditional varieties was much higher than 15 parts per million, 15 milligrams. Okay, so we, we did all this breeding, but we didn't pay attention to a very important element, nutritional element, that was in the rice grain. And so through biofortification, we can breed for varieties, and everything that I'm going to talk about is conventional plant breeding. We've now developed high zinc rice varieties for Bangladesh that have 30 parts per million. So we can, when, when biofortified varieties are fully adopted in Bangladesh, and it'll take 20 to 25 years to replace everything, we'll be able to write 12 milligrams across that, across that brown row up there. And instead of all the, all the income groups being below 13 milligrams, which is the estimated average requirement, all the income groups will be above 13 milligrams, okay? So that's, that's what biofortification is all about, is, is working on increasing the minerals and vitamins in the food staples that people already eat in large amounts. So we've made, we've made a lot of progress since 1993. Uh, we're now released in 30 countries. Uh, high zinc wheat, I just had a meeting yesterday uh, with the wheat breeders here in Nepal and three high zinc wheat varieties will be released. The first biofortified varieties will be released uh, in Nepal next year. They're released in 30 countries and Nepal is one of the uh, 25 plus countries where they'll be released in the next four or five years. 
So these are, we have high zinc rice, high zinc wheat, high provitamin A maize, et cetera. I don't, I don't really have too much time to go through. And it's, uh, it's a global, those 55 countries, you know, it's a global program. So we spread throughout Asia, Africa, Latin America. So any, any one of those countries in green either has a release or, or will have a release in the next few years. And more recently, we've also looked at the effect of fertilizers on the grain content. When you put, when you put uh, fertilizers on a crop and compare them with not putting fertilizers on, even though you increase the yield, you increase the grain quality. So this shows that, see, what the, what the plants do is they take up the zinc and the iron from the soils and they deposit them in the plant tissues. And then when the seed is being formed, those, that zinc and iron is translocated from the plant tissues into the seed grain. And different varieties have different sets of genes that either make that more efficient or less efficient. But when you put fertilizer on your crop, there's more protein in the grain and there's more iron and zinc that gets translocated to the grain. The, the protein is like the sink for depositing the iron in the zinc. So in addition, there's a lot you can do when you actually put the trace minerals in the fertilizers or when you put them in the sprays. When you, when you spray a, a crop, say per, for pesticides or for whatever, if you put zinc, iodine, and selenium uh, you know, during the growth period, we've shown in principle that scientifically you can greatly increase the zinc density, the iodine density, and the selenium density in the grain. And so we're looking for ways of uh, implementing policies that give farmers incentives uh, to put these elements in their sprays. So again, this is, uh, this is something working on that food staple group that can be done. And we've shown with, uh, with a study in India of high zinc wheat, we had mother-child pairs uh, what the uh, intervention group ate the high zinc wheat, the control group ate the regular wheat, the non-biofortified wheat, and we showed a reduction in the morbidity of the children and the mothers uh, in, the, in the group that uh, had the high zinc wheat as compared with the control group. And this, is, this has been uh, published now in the, in the nutrition literature. In fact, Harvest Plus has commissioned 14 efficacy trials that have that have been published and shown very positive results in terms of the, of the micronutrient status and functional outcomes of the biofortified foods. So this is, a, this is a picture of an orange maize, conventionally bred orange maize that, we're, that we've made available in Africa that's being disseminated in Africa. And the whole idea is 25 years from now, all the mazes in Africa will be orange and there'll be no more white maize. Carrots used to be white and purple, and people have forgotten that. So I'm hoping that 30 years from now, Africans will have forgotten about white maize. Let's see, let's see what happens. So I think the, the most important point that I want to make is, in biofortification, we're just asking families to substitute one for one. If you eat this much white maize, instead eat this much orange maize. Because they're high yielding, they sell for the same price. So again, we come back to the budget constraint. They sell for the same price. You make the substitution and you don't have to spend any more on your food expenditures by substituting. But when you eat the orange maize, you get more vitamin A than when you eat the white maize. So that's the basic strategy. So now let's move to the fish and animal foods. What do we do there? Well, in this case, we're not asking for a one for one substitution. We want people to eat more fish and animal products. And the only way we can get them to eat more fish and animal products is to lower the price because they only have a certain amount of money to spend on their diet. So how do we, how do we, we have to lower the price. So, an ex, so, um, yeah, let me skip this. So an example is uh, they had Operation Flood in India and they, they said, okay, milk is, you know, is an important food in the Indian diet. It's a very nutritious food. And they implemented a nationwide program called Operation Flood. And they brought the price down by 50%. Great, it's the same, you know, if you lower the price by 50%, you can, you can buy more milk, you can have more milk. 
And when the price goes down, people demand more, they eat more, okay? So that's the basic, uh, that's the basic strategy. It's on the supply side. You, I don't like this idea of uh, very general, you know, generalizing and saying we need to we need to improve the productivity of animal and fish products and and stop there. No, you have to find a specific food and you have to implement a program and you have to stick at it for 10 or 15 years or 20 years, or however long it takes to bring the price down in the country, and then then you really have an impact on nutrition. So. The price, I've made the point that the price goes down so people can eat more. Um, eggs is another, is another example. They're not traded internationally, so if you have an inefficient egg production sector, there are ways to make it more productive that will bring egg prices down. I like the example of small fish. When you, when you eat a large fish, you just eat the filet. When you eat a small fish, you pop the whole thing in your mouth. It's much more nutritious to eat a small fish because it, you eat the bones, you eat the eyes, you eat the brains, and they're the things that are, that are dense in the minerals and vitamins. But all the, all the, a lot of the work of the uh, fish industry is to always have bigger and bigger fish. Well, maybe there's something we can do to improve the productivity of uh, small fish production that people eat whole. Okay, and, and another important point I want to make is that when you have smallholder producers produce these very expensive animal products, they don't want to eat them because they consider that a huge luxury to eat them. They would rather sell them and get the money than to eat them because they, they, they would feel bad almost if they ate them because, you know, who, I can't afford to eat this very expensive food. So you really, have to, you really have to do it on a nationwide basis, improve productivity, and get the price down. So it's basically, with the non-staple foods, it's basically the same, uh, the same strategy. I did want to make the point, these are some data from the Philippines, and I did want to make the point that there, there do tend to be a few foods that provide a lot of the vitamin A in the diet, and they tend to come from the non-staple plant foods. Um, so, you know, you look there when you're, when you're working on the, non on the vitamin A problem or the vitamin problem in general, you'll probably find your key foods in the non-staple food group. Um, again, you need to, you know, you need to, you need to reduce the price. Um, nutrition education, there may be a lot that you can do to say don't eat these vegetables, they're not as nutritious as these vegetables, so you get them to substitute and eat the more nutritious vegetables, the more nutritious fruits. But once you start really um, you know, increasing the demand for particular foods that are more nutritious, you're going to start driving the price up because people, everybody's going to want to switch. And once you start driving the price up, people will eat less. So you really need productivity. Again, you still need productivity increases uh, for those particular vegetables and fruits. So this is, uh, this is kind of my, my summary slide um, on strategies. So I always like matrices. So you see the, the row are staple foods and the second row are non-staple foods. And the columns are what I want to draw your attention to. There's indirect behavior change and there's direct behavior change. I, I regard uh, increasing incomes and changing food prices as indirect behavior change. If you lower the price, people buy more. If you raise the price, people buy less. You don't have to go out and, and tell them what they should do. They react to those prices. I'm an economist, I like, I like uh, inexpensive solutions, easy solutions, so I go, for the, I go for the price options. The biofortification of iron and zinc, you can't see iron, you can't see zinc in the crops. I just want to, over time, replace all the staple food crops with the iron and the zinc biofortified varieties. When, after 20 years, when everybody goes to the market, the only thing they can buy in the market will be the biofortified foods. You don't have to say, buy this one and don't buy that one. I really, I really like indirect behavior change. 
I can't do that with the pro vitamin A varieties because you see the color change. You have to tell people why they should eat orange maize and not eat white maize. And once you tell them why it's orange and once they taste it and they like to the taste, they get it and they switch. It's just a matter of how do you get that information, get that information to people. So of course, nutrition education, uh, homestead gardening, those involve a lot of, they involve a lot of behavior change. So you have to be, you just have to stay aware that those are, uh, you know, those are more expensive, they're more difficult to, to uh, affect behavior change. So that's my, that's my own personal perspective. Thank you very much.